Hola, buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, soy Raúl Gómez. My name is Raúl Gómez, I am the Director of Transición Verde and on my name and on behalf of the Green European Foundation I wanted to thank you all for spending some of your time this afternoon with this webinar and I'm sure that considering the topic at hand and the speakers that we are having here today you will not regret it. The title for the event is Geopolitics um, in a Post-Growth Era, Europe at a Crossroads and this is part of a project that that we have been working on with the GEF and other European foundations under the coordination of uh, Richard Wouters, who will be one of our speakers today. And with him, we will have Gaia Harrington and Jesus, Jesus Núñez. And our moderator will be Lourdes Lucia, who is now going to be taking the floor. But I wanted to say a couple of things before I start regarding logistics. The first one is that the session can be followed along both in Spanish and English. And you have to click on the globe icon that you have on the bottom side of your screen. It's like a globe and it says interpretation in it. And you have to choose the language that you choose to follow along in. And we will have Matilde Burgo interpreting and it's always a pleasure. So you can always choose Spanish and when someone speaks English, you will be listening to Matilde's voice. And if you want to make comments, if you want to ask questions to our speakers so that Lourdes can ask those questions later on, you can use the chat box. So any comment, any question, please use the chat box. That's what we're going to be using. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Lourdes Lucia, who's a lawyer and an editor. She's also a translator and the co-author of various books. And she's always been very much linked to the publishing houses um, world. And she has been in debate and club intellectual, always um, an activist with regards to peace, the environment, democracy. She was a co-founder of... Uh, of attack in Spain, and she still participates in activities such as um, neighborhood activities against the depredation of nature or other sorts of activism. But she's always there, always in the fight. Lourdes, I give you the floor so that you can lead this meeting. Thank you very much, Raúl, and good afternoon, everyone. And first of all, I wanted to thank the Foundation Transición Verde Europea for organizing this webinar where we will be talking about the report post-growth uh, post geopolitics Europe at a crossroads. Thank you so much to the people who are here today and the people who are in charge of the technical work um, such as Matilde, the translator, and also I would like to thank the three people who are going to be intervening and the people that I'm going to be introducing now. So first of all, we will give the floors to the floor to Richard Wooders, who is a project leader and researcher at the Green Links Bureau, the think tank of the Dutch Green Party, where he works on issues such as raw materials, energy, technology, and geopolitics. He leads the project Geopolitics on a Post-Growth Europe for the Green European Foundation. As advisor to the Green Links, he co-wrote numerous publications and electoral programs. So, hi, Richard. And Gaia Harrington is a Dutch econometrician. She is a research on sustainability, a researcher on sustainability, and she's an activist and she fights for human rights. In 2021, her study update to limits limits to growth comparing the World 3 model with empirical data, which confirmed the conclusions of the Club of Rome's in 1972 report, was something that created waves worldwide. And she published the book Five Insights for Avoiding Global Collapse. She works and lives in the US. She's the vice president of sustainability research at Schneider Electric, and she is a member of the Transformational Economics Commission and Hi, Gaia. Thank you so much for being here. And Jesus Núñez is the co-director of the Institute of Studies on Conflicts and Humanitarian Action. He's an expert in international relations, international security, peace building and prevention of violent conflicts and the Arab Muslim world. He is an economist from the Autonomous University in Madrid and he is a retired military officer. He is also a professor of international relations at the University um, of Comillas and he's a member of the 
International Institute for Strategic Studies and a member of the Spanish Committee of UNRWA. And I'm going to give the floor to Richard so that he can uh, present to us this report on geopolitics for a post-growth Europe for the Green European Foundation. Richard was the coordinator of this report, so um, I'm well giving him the floor. Thank you, Lourdes. Uh, so I did we write this report, uh, basically to get a conversation going between critics of economic growth and geopolitical thinkers. Uh, Post-growth and geopolitics are two ways of looking at a world that do not go well together. Or to put it uh, differently, ecological and geopolitical security are hard to reconcile. It is unlikely that we will be able to solve the climate and biodiversity crisis as long as our, our economy continues to grow. To get back into balance with the living world, we need to scale back overproduction and overconsumption. Um, that is the call of the degrowth movement. More and more scientists agree that rich countries should stop chasing growth of their gross domestic product, GDP, and the next speaker, Gaia Harrington, We'll tell you more about the limits to growth. Um, one important insight that we borrowed from Gaia is that it is better to manage the end of growth through democratic deliberation than to have it imposed on us by ecological breakdown that would spell massive social upheaval. However, degrowth or post growth uh, is not popular with experts in foreign and security policy. And it is easy to see why. In geopolitics, many determinants of power, trade, aid, uh, technology, defense, are closely linked to GDP. If they do not ignore planetary boundaries altogether, geopolitical thinkers prefer to talk about green growth. But it is precisely this narrative of green growth that degrowth and post-growth thinkers try to refute. Whereas geopolitical thinkers opt for an easy way out by embracing green growth, many degrowthers also cut corners. Their pacifism and anti-militarism is uh, downright naive, in my view, at a time when aggressive autocracies uh, are invading their democratic uh, neighbors. Russia's imperialist attack on Ukraine has brought war to the doorstep of the European Union. That forces us to take a hard look at defense and deterrence. After all, the transition beyond growth must be democratic. Democracy offers a public space to challenge the growth dogma. Uh, many degrowthers even advocate deepening democracy by extending it to the economic sphere as a way to overcome the growth compulsion of shareholder cap capitalism. Democracy, in turn, relies on constitutional safeguards that protect the rule of law, pluralism, and human rights. Um, preventing ecological collapse will not only require green policies at the national level, but also unprecedented global cooperation. That will not happen in a world uh, where might is right, uh, a world of autocrats that would be a world of even more violent chaos. Um, democracies can misbehave as well, but they are more inclined to resolve conflicts resolver... global rules that just about every country has agreed to. Um, so a re rules-based international order is indispensable, not just for preventing more wars, but also for tackling the climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, so the degrowth movement should be more concerned about protecting democracy, human rights, and the international rule of law. In turn, geopolitical thinkers would do well to recognize the limits to growth. Together, they should try to find answers to some uneasy questions, um, which I put on the screen. Um, can we stop pursuing, pursuing economic growth and still be a global actor? Uh, um, would a post-growth European Union be able to defend itself, uh, its allies, its values, and um, can post growth and geopolitics uh, support each other? If so, how? 
In our report, which we based on interviews and meetings, um, we offer some tentative answers to these questions. And I will briefly outline some of these answers. A post-growth EU would have to be more united in its external policies. Uh, and this includes getting serious about defense integration. Um, the current fragmentation of national armed forces is very inefficient. Um, the, the European Union uh, national armed forces have some 180 different major weapon systems, while the United States only has 30, for instance. And these 180 weapon systems uh, sometimes can't even communicate with each other. Uh, that makes it difficult to uh, cooperate, and it's too expensive. Of the 200 billion euros that the 27 EU countries spend each year on defense, 20 to 120 billion could be saved, depending on the level of integration. And these savings could be used to increase combat power. The better the member states' military forces fit together, the more bang we get for our buck. Um, defense integration would also require that EU governments jointly develop and procure new weapon systems. Um, it is urgent today to strengthen EU defense. Uh, in the global rivalry between democracy and autocracy, the US may well defect from our camp at the next presidential election, if Trump gets elected. Uh, we need to prepare for an Atlantic storm. NATO may lose its credibility as the guarantor of our security. Uh, we, as the EU, need to be able to support Ukraine and defend ourselves against Russian aggression without relying on the US. This is a total order. I know the Spanish left is not fond of NATO. Well then, Meet the moment, rise to the occasion, I would say. Take responsibility for the security of our continent, for the defense of democracy. And this starts in Ukraine. Spain lags behind in providing military, financial and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, as you can see on the screen. Spain gives less than significantly smaller countries, such as Sweden and Denmark. Uh, Spain is still importing LNG from Russia, liquefied nat natural gas, uh, thereby funding the aggressor. Um, sorry for being blunt, but Spain should clean up its act. Call your government. Um, taking in new members would become an even stronger geopolitical imperative for a post-growth EU. More members means more resources, more legitimacy. Ukraine, if it survives the Russian invasion, with our help, could be a formidable ally even before accession, both in terms of civil courage and military strength. Um, EU enlargement must be accompanied by a more robust oversight of the rule of law, human rights and democracy. It, it only takes one outlier, like the authoritarian Hungarian government today, to undermine mutual trust and triple decision-making in the EU. The growth of the far right, including in my own country, the Netherlands, makes it all the more important that the EU acts, acts against democratic backsliding within its borders. The EU should be less tolerant of the intolerant. It should become a militant democracy. The post-growth EU would not only benefit from having more members, but also from having more partners. Our report contains many proposals for strengthening partnerships, non-exclusive partnerships with the Global South. Some of these uh, proposals will be costly for an EU without economic growth, but global security comes at a price. Um, one of the synergies between post-growth and geopolitics Maybe the fact that a post-growth EU would be less dependent on imported energy and materials, but this will also increase tensions with the Global South. Increasing the export of natural resources is often still viewed as a way to develop the economy, even by democratically elected uh, progressive governments of not-so-poor countries such as Brazil and Chile. 
our report outlines a partial way out of this dilemma um, because a post growth EU would still need critical metals for its energy transition. Um, that's painful, but it also One minute, please, creates One minute. an opportunity to assist metal mining countries in adding more value to their metal ores, for instance, by helping them to produce batteries. That would provide them with more income and better jobs. You can find more proposals in our report. Uh, the report also contains some of the interviews that we held, and each language version, uh, including the Spanish one, has a different selection of interviews. And you can find all the interviews we conducted on this website. And we are very grateful to the interviewees, including Gaia Harrington and Jose Nunez, uh, because they provided us with very important insights. There will be more webinars and seminars on post-growth and geopolitics this year. If you want to keep up to date, subscribe to the newsletter of the Green European Foundation. And if you want to send me any good ideas, uh, here's my email address. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion. Muchas gracias, Richard. Thank you so much, Richard. And we will now give the floor to Gaia. And then with Jesus, we're going to be formulating one question that is similar for both of them, for Gaia and Jesus, so that in 10 minutes each, they can develop that, their answers as they wish. We would like you to talk about the dilemma that Europe is currently facing that is that is dividing us between the urgent need to advance towards post-growth so that we can tackle this um, climatic, well, climate and biodiversity crisis and at the same time survive and maintain our economic situation. So that we are in a good economic situation and that is becoming very complicated in the geopolitical field. So I would like you to um, to ask you both Gaia and Jesus to talk about the aspects that you know best and that you think are fundamental or those that worry you most. Okay. Yes, thank you. Very glad to be here. I'm also very much looking forward to the discussion later on. Uh, so let's start with the, the question uh, that Richard also posed. Um, how can post-growth and geopolitics work together? And in very short, I would say, well, let's talk about well-being economics. That's the term I use. Uh, so very quickly, my, my name is Gaia. I was born in Europe, but I now live in the US. I work at a big multinational, uh, Snyder Electric, as their uh, VP Sustainability Research. Uh, Snyder Electric works in the energy transition. I'm an advisor to the Club of Rome, and I talk about and, and write about these kind of things, so systemic sustainability issues, and increasingly I'm being called a well-being economist. Uh, what's well-being economics? Well, we just discussed the need to move beyond growth as the ultimate goal for the economy. That doesn't mean we're anti-growth, but it shouldn't be the top priority. And so then the question is, what do you replace it with? And the that proposal is then well-being, human well-being and ecological well-being. You could also say more like as Kate Rayworth frames it, meeting human needs within planetary boundaries. So in this economy, you design it so that people and, plaf uh, and, and uh, people and planet are strictly above profit. Profit is fine. Growth can also be fine. We want to have growth in renewable energy. It's just not the ultimate goal, very simply put. And so that's increasingly being proposed as a sort of overall paradigm for um, these kind of post-growth policies. What does this mean concretely, though? And I think it's worth lingering around that. I did, uh, as, as was mentioned, I did my research on limits to growth. And when you talk about limits to growth, a lot of people hear, oh, we all have to do less. When you say degrowth, they're like, oh, that sounds like a permanent recession. And really, it's a lot better than that. It's, it's actually a more fun place to live. Because what does it mean, a well-being economy? Well, it means that we have to deliberately bring our environmental footprint down. We know that we, we are above our share of the Earth's carrying capacity. And so 
uh, how you do that without growth is it's really not impossible. You just have to share what you already have. And when you share more, you bring down inequalities, you create community and connection. So it's actually also in that way, uh, it benefits our well-being also in all these social needs that we have for to have a sense of meaning in our lives. And so concretely, what this, this would look like is an economy where we work much less hour, a much shorter work week, say 15, 20 hours should be enough. And you work in meaningful jobs. So you don't ju just do tricks for your income. You actually are working to, let's say, regenerate uh, nature, uh, to clean up stuff, um, to really help people uh, in their health and that sort of thing. We have locally grown food, of course, with knowledge of local environmental factors, much less waste. We have clean energy, obviously, but it's it's not just clean in terms of green less greenhouse gases. It's clean in the sense that there's not plastic in everything we eat and sit on. Uh, and breathe. Uh, they're not these like about 80,000 chemical uh, uh, toxins in there that we doctors think are bad for our health, but they haven't been properly tested, but they're out there anyway. All those things will be brought down. Uh, we will, because we will want to meet our needs with much lower environmental impact, we're going to be sharing a lot more. So we're going to have libraries, not just for books, but for tools and for toys and all those kind of things. We're going to have low impact leisure activities, which you typically do with one another. So you're going to have make music together or just go for walks to all those things. And as a result, we have better physical health and as well as mental health. So it's really a well-being ec economy is about less stuff, but a lot more of the things that we actually want. And so it's, it's an atmosphere of conviviality and generosity and fun. So with that in mind, back to the geopolitics, I think it's a good to, for a second, realize that uh, business as usual is not an option. So what worked in the past will not work going forward. Um, typically, when you have these kind of uh, discussions around, okay, what should change? People always talk about the cost of changing. There are also costs of doing nothing because that's a choice as well. This is from my research. Uh, people mentioned the limits to growth. So what I did was I took a few scenarios of that limits to growth publication and I compared that to empirical data because this publication was in, in the 70s. So we had a couple of decades worth of data. And uh, this is the human welfare, so well-being variable. The dashed purple line is the empirical data. So what I found was that we are actually aligned pretty closely to the business as usual scenario that was made again in the 70s. Uh, that one shows that uh, indicates a collapse setting in around present time. So as you can see, there are two business as usual scenarios. The only difference between them is uh, the, the, the assumed amount of non-renewable resources, because we don't know exactly how much fossil fuels we have, et cetera. doesn't matter. We have a collapse in both scenarios, all right? Uh, it, it just sets in a little bit later. Um, really what this comes down, we, we, you don't need my research to know this. Everybody on this call already knows this. Uh, everybody knows about the IPCC reports, et cetera. But we're bumping into limits. What that means is that growth is going to halt one way or another. And as Richard already summarized my research very uh, accurately, we have a choice now. Either we maintain what we have, which would be the yellow scenario that does not end in collapse. Um, and that is a scenario that comes most closely to a uh, well-being eco uh, economy. They, the authors didn't call it that, but that's what it is. Uh, or we bring, or we go down. Continuing to grow is is not an option. We're, that's not where we are um, in this point of human history. And so uh, when you couple that back to geopolitics, uh, yes, that, that used to be a source of power. Um, for On one side, that's a design choice, right? You don't have to do voting based on GDP size or growth rate. You can do just do one country, one vote. And we, we could... That, that's just a human choice and we could change that. But even apart from that, of course, um, you, yes, you do need physical capital to be to be able to, to defend yourself, for example. Um, but that's not the only thing you need. You also need social capital. And I think that's an important thing 
to keep in mind. Uh, what we see right now is that these, this growth-based economy is, we all know the environmental impacts, that's without a doubt, that's bad. But what is a little bit less known is that it also drives social disenfranchisement. That's the, uh, and that's what we see. We see a lot of social unrest because of increasing income inequalities, other inequalities. Uh, that's where the rising populism comes from. So uh, a growth-based economy is not just environmentally degenerative. It's also socially degenerative. And you really can wonder if your uh, social capital is being eroded how is that good for your geopolitical standing? You know, uh, it, another thing about about warfare is technology, right? So people talk about innovation that we need. Where does innovation come from? It comes from a group of people who have access to the education they want, working together, having not being continuously stressed, thinking, huh, what if we try this and then try it out? That you can easily imagine that happening a lot more in a well-being economy uh, instead of less. Uh, so you you know you know and these and these policies and underlying values, right? This notion of we share uh, the biggest shoulders carry the biggest uh, biggest weight. Th those kind of things they're actually widely popular, for especially in Europe. So you see this very very uh, very. Uh, uh, discreetly in in surveys where people just a majority of people just agree with it, but around the world you see post growth thinking picking up in Japan, even in the U.S. Uh, so you know, in the end, you could easily ask the opposite question, right? Uh, can you still defend yourself if you let go of growth? Uh, yeah, that's a fair question. We should talk about it. At the same time, you could also just as easily ask the question. If you hold on to this growth-based economy, while you won't be able to pursue that anymore, while face being on the precipice of collapse, uh, can you still defend yourself while you are exhausting your natural capital and, and fraying your social cohesion? Um, I, I think that's harder. I think, lastly, I think the Ukraine is an excellent example of that. You see that you everybody Ukraine took everybody by surprise, but why? Are they holding on? It's because they have their social capital. They know what they're fighting for. Uh, the Club of Rome is now working with the Ukrainian government, and I'm I'm in that uh, group. And they have they their short term goal is winning the war, but they have a long term vision. They know what they're fighting for. They un, they say we want to have democracy. Yeah. Perdona. We, eh? Un huh? oh, yeah. They we want to have democracy. We want to have clean water. We want to have um, clean energy. Um, this is what we're working on with the government. They're like, when, not if, when we win the war, we want to be this kind of well-being uh, country. Um, and I think that's the social capital that keeps them going. So I'll leave it to that to for discussion. I'll leave you with um, a couple of links. I don't know if these uh, shares, uh, these slides will be shared, uh, but my, my update uh, is in the Journal of Industrial Ecology. Uh, you could there's a there's also the update in my book which is free for download you just google it and there are a couple of other links including um a free one hour lecture about post growth thank you Muchas gracias, Gaia. Se ha compartido en pantalla los enlaces. Thank you so much, Gaia. We have shared all of the links, and we will have time later on to to keep on talking about this topic. But I will I would now like to give the floor to Jesús so that he may take the floor and talk about all of this all of this question that we have been tackling for the last ten minutes. So I give him the floor. Okay, buenas tardes, Lourdes. okay, good afternoon, Lourdes. It is a pleasure to be here with you and share this afternoon with you with such an interesting topic. And I'm going to go straight to the topic uh, tackled by Lourdes from a geopolitical perspective, which is the field I am an expert in. I think that we should maybe start considering that the Ukraine and Gaza, just to give two clear examples, show in a very obvious way that we are not in um, an international order based on, on rules. There are 
are two thresholds and two ways of measuring things depending on the interests at uh, play, depending on the geopolitical situation, different situations will be made and they have nothing to do with the rules that we have imposed on us theoretically to try and manage the geopolitical situation we find ourselves in. And from that point of view, I think that what we are currently seeing is a scenario of competition between big powers. And obviously the scenario has been defined by a US that wants to maintain its hegemony and a China that is in expansion mode that is challenging that hegemony. So in that context, the EU has not even managed to be a big power because they don't have a unique voice. They don't have a sole voice. They are an imperfect actor. So what I mean by this is that when we think about uh, something such a post-growth scenario, we have the same situation as with disarmament, when we talk about disarmament for defense. When we talk about unilateral disarmament, we are condemning ourselves to be extremely vulnerable and nothing can be uh, gotten out of it. The disarmament has to be multilateral or uh, it won't work. And with post-growth, the same thing happens. Imagine that the EU thinks on its own, disconnected from that international growth, something similar to a post-growth economy. That would, um, that obviously would not work if China and the US are not in that same dynamic. So it, from the beginning, it would be to go against the current. And obviously that has costs that currently no no country wants to consider. And when we think about national governments, we have to think about everything from the point of view that for any chief of state or president, the end of the world war, the the furthest from from sight uh, scenario that you can think of is the next elections and the, ne and, the, and the rest is out of the agenda. So from that point of view, only if we share the urgency of the fact that the climate crisis that has been defined together with the uh, mass destruction, arms proliferation and technological disruption considered as an existential threat for humankind, only if we share that urgency to face that, that threat, could we simultaneously set up a process, um, dynamic that would take us to a different scenario, a geopolitical framework and geoeconomic framework that is different to the one that we have. But unfortunately, from my point of view, we haven't reached that point yet because we don't have the critical mass that we need for that to happen because those pushing from national governments and international institutions are not all pushing in the same direction. And when we think about about that factor, when we understand that factor, then we can understand as well immediately that when we think, if we think about it from the EU, if we think about post-growth scenarios, then the thing is about seeing what is more important is not really post-growth, but in any case, this this um, illusion that has been uh, de de refuted, but that still comes about, which is the fact that technology will solve the problems that we have created or that we can reach, and we have seen that during the last COP in Dubai, that we can try to reduce the consumption of, uh, of fossil fuels. But unfortunately, we, we cannot go beyond that. There isn't a common position. And within the uh, scenario of the EU, we don't have a common position amongst the 27 with regards to this topic. The governments have not even included it in their political agenda. Um, governments and, and, and community institutions have not reached a common position with regards to that point. And if we add to that the fact that nowadays the GDP, the, so the growth of GDP is still the, um, the way in which we measure your presence in international institutions, your weight in the World Bank or in the IMF, that is all measured by the GDP, then obviously it becomes even more difficult to imagine how a government is going to to leave growth aside or decide to no longer be important in the international context. I'm not saying all of these things from the point of view that, that I deny the need for that post-growth scenario, but rather to highlight the great obstacles that we're facing to reach that point, because what is imposed in the short term and the international politics 
are still being uh, led by a short-term mindset is considering that these things are still very important for the decisions made by our governments. And from that point of view, and I'll, and I'll conclude shortly, when we think about all the mobilization that we are seeing in the primary sector in many European uh, countries, what started in Germany and that we're currently seeing in in Spain, after Italy and France and other countries, if we go to the yellow jackets, for instance, yellow vests, sorry, we know that right now gas and nuclear energy have been greenwashed so that well, that is the signal that we're getting so that we can keep on betting for the same model without thinking about a new model, then we can understand that what we have is a dynamic that is making it ever more difficult to get out of the current scenario. Since if I look at the next elections, the European elections, June next year, June this year, sorry, what we see is an increase of ultranationalist movements and far right movements, which are actually negationists. They refuse to ac acknowledge climate crisis. So it will be very difficult in the short term with this dynamics to impose or at least to promote a post-growth model. And all of it with just one last reference. When we think about all of the uh, current scheme, everything is based on this geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, principle which is based on the, the security of states and the defense of the higher interests of the state, which very often go beyond the interest of people and human beings. So one of our m missing points, one of the things that we have to do is to achieve for the humankind security with all of its dimensions to be present with the same weight than, than, than the security of states, because only if we can think about humankind security can we think about the sustainability of our models. So as Richard and Gaia have said, this way, this path is at an end. We do not have a possibility of continuing with growth. But once again, the concept of humankind safety is almost uh, has almost disappeared. It was born in the 90s after the Cold War, uh, with Canada, Japan, and some other countries that were pushing that concept um, along, that were focusing on human beings, on the satisfaction of the basic needs of human of human beings, and the full respect of human rights. But that has disappeared as of today. So what I have tried was to just talk about the big hurdles along the way to try and manage for that scheme that um, to replace the current the current scheme so that we can go along the way of post growth because there are many previous conditions that are needed so that it can go beyond the 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 efforts made by just one nation by just one government considering the difficulties that we have at the EU who we don't know what it will be when it grows up because we have eurocentrism we have neutrals we have um, all sorts of all sorts of different trends and it's very difficult for the 27 members to follow the same road. So I will stop here and we will have the possibility of keeping on talking about this topic later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesus, and thank you very much for managing the time so well to all of you. There are lots of questions on the chat from the people participating in this debate, so we will have time at the end to talk about them. And I would like to ask Richard now, could a, a post-growth EU play a role in shaping world politics rather than merely being subordinate to it? Thank you, Lourdes. Um, it could, but it would, to, it would have to um, work better uh, together than it does uh, today. I, I try to um, explain that in my presentation uh, as well. Uh, um, especially on the external uh, policies, uh, European diplomacy is, is often a cacophony of uh, national uh, self-inflation. Um, EU governments should really work better together, and, and that also uh, should be case in the uh, domain of uh, of defence, as I uh, explained. Um, in that case, I think, yes, we could uh, still be uh, uh, an actor and, and defend ourselves and our uh, allies 
in a post growth uh, scenario. Um, I, I agree with Gaia that uh, regardless of geopolitics, we should prepare for uh, post growth and uh, focus on a, a well being uh, economy. Uh, because apart from uh, ecological disaster, there are other factors that uh, may soon herald the end of economic uh, growth. Um, the EU is, uh, has a, an aging uh, population, uh, conflicts arising all over the world, uh, uh, threatening uh, our supply chains. Um, then we have the rise of the, the, the far right in the European Union, uh, the more they are represented in governments, it, the harder it will be for the EU to uh, to work together. Uh, all these factors uh, um, force us to uh, to face the prospects of uh, the end of economic growth. And yeah, then uh, it's better to be prepared than to uh, to have it imposed uh, on us. Um, as Gaia said uh, as well. Um, in external policies, the EU can uh, unite by and large, uh, but it often does so at the last moment. We've seen that uh, after the invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russia. I would see, I'd like to see our, our governments uh, unite uh, uh, earlier, because uh, that's the only way uh, to to be a global uh, actor, uh, look at the uh, uh, conflict between Israel and Hamas. Uh, the EU is uh, divided there, and uh, therefore it uh, it plays no role uh, at all. We're the biggest uh, trading partner of Israel. Israel, we're the biggest donor of the Palestinians, uh, but no one listens to the EU because. Uh, um, we uh, send out completely contradictory uh, messages. So uh, more European unity is, is paramount in a post-growth scenario. Thank you so much, Richard. I would like now to ask Gaia, because you talked about the well-being economy and that was very interesting. So how can we make the transition uh, towards that well-being economy? Right, right. Yeah, because that's what I propose, right? Uh, so uh, Jesus, he uh, mentioned a couple of obstacles, and I agree. Within the current economic system, we will not make the systemic changes. That's exactly why I advocate for changing the economic system. If it could have been done within the current growth-based economy, it would have happened by now. So that's why we have to go to the economy itself and change that. Um, so uh, just just one note, uh, the, I am not calling for disarmament at all. I, I actually think that uh, geopolitics uh, can, can, uh, and, and post-growth can reach each other across the aisle with the well-being because safety is paramount to well-being too. So it very much depends on the context. Costa Rica has dis disarmed, but that has that's a very different setting. That's in the context of its protection from the US. So they had uh, the luck to be able to do that. Uh, they are one of the most sustainable countries in the world. Ukraine, which we work with, uh, that's not in our plan for their well-being economy to disarm. I, I mean, one of the pillars there is, of course, also to be the so-called uh, frontline NATO partner. So this is it very much, and that makes sense. I mean, you, if you want to have well-being of your citizens in Ukrainian or say Finland's uh, position, you know, you, you can't dis disarm. So it, it very much depends on the context of how you will uh, implement a well-being economy at the, the, the local level or the national level. Um, but in general, how you will want to make that transition, right, from our current growth-based economy to a well-being one, where, again, we can still have growth, it's just not the ultimate goal. So we do not sacrifice environment and social goods anymore. Uh, but if it increases well-being, let's do it. And if growth, if it grows, that's fine. So how do we make that transition? I think 
uh, there are several ways to answer that question. So I will start with concrete policies. So, because these are very clearly defined by now, we know what we need to do. Political feasibility might be a different thing, but we know we have to drastically bring down income inequalities, right? Uh, so we tax the rich more, much more. Um, we yeah, There's going to be a, a guaranteed basic dividend and or income, job guarantees, good adequate pension schemes, uh, affordable health care, uh, that sort of thing. Um, what that means, basically, ultimately, on a macro level, you basically are cutting the dependency of our livelihoods to growth. That's what the point of those policies. What we now do and why degrowth is sometimes so toxic is because when people hear degrowth, they hear, I I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my job. And that's a legitimate fear. Uh, but what the answer to that is not to keep pursuing growth, which is impossible at a certain point. It's to cut the dependency of our livelihoods to growth. And that's what these kind of policies do. Uh, these these dependencies are designed. We don't have to do that. We can we can afford all these things like a national guarantee. Um, some a very small percentage of the population will have to do with much less. We cannot no longer have private jets or big multi million dollar yards. I think that's an acceptable sacrifice. Um, so that's the macroeconomic answer. And then ultimately, the third one, the last one, is really. Um, our mindset, ontology, our, our narrative about what we say to each other, about what we think we are, what humans are, what, uh, what the world is, and what world we want to live in. That's ultimately what we want to have. We want to have a new narrative. Do Are we holding on to this idea of domination, where humans are separate from nature and should dominate it? Or are we part of nature? Are we nature? Um, is there no such separation even uh, between that? Is 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 God above us, or if it's, is it in everything? And if it's imminent, we should respect everything around us as such. So this goes ultimately to a very deep level about uh, our shared narrative as human beings. Thank you, Gaia. Thank you, Gaia. Gracias, Gaia. Jesus, do you think that the pressure of uh, social movements and collectives could maybe have an influence on the decisions adopted by the EU towards a really ecological force and to to force them to to take a step in a short period of time? Or do you think that there is still a long way to go in order to achieve this? Well, it's not just a belief. I The thing is that, that we can go to the facts. If we have a treaty for, um, for uh, minds for, that made people and the governments to approve the Ottawa Treaty, if we have an, a weapons and arms treatment, it's because the civil society managed to force for the um, arms trade to be regulated. So obviously civil society is an actor that needs to be considered. It's not the most important, obviously, it's not the only one, but it is an, um, a very important element in a globalized world such as the one we live in, especially in those places where we have full democracies, because in other places, unfortunately, they do not have that civil society because the authoritarian regimes are dedicated to eliminating that civil society. So from that point of view, we always have to have this need of, of being informed, of raising awareness, of mobilizing in favor of certain frameworks that try to go beyond the reality that we see has reached its limits. But it's also true, and I'm saying this to avoid frustrations, that we, that we always have to remember that civil society is not the one making all the decisions. We are facing political order problems that will have to be resolved by political agents. And in today's world, those are national governments and international entities. So if there is political incidents and we make pressure, we exercise pressure at the civil society level, that could accelerate processes. But we must never think that it is in our hands to change things from one day to the next. So we always have to understand that there is an effort there. We have to go step by step, and it has to be in the long term in order to achieve those long-term transformations. I have just given you two examples that have certain results in some cases, and in others they don't. And finally, just to try and, and mention some of the things that have been said by Richard and Gaia, 
I maybe we we were wrong, and when we thought that well-being economy was enough to show that it is a different scenario from post-growth, you can have a well-being within growth. So I don't think it's a clear alternative, and. And we can also reduce inequalities without rejecting growth. So it's not really alternative models one from the other. What we need to understand is the need to change the framework. And I was talking about a concept that I think it's, is central, which is that of human humankind safety. We have to focus on the well-being of each human being and have all their basic needs satisfied and to focus on human beings and see their fundamental rights respected. If we can add that to the security or safety of states, of borders against external threats and the guarantee of living in peace within a certain territory, then obviously in that way, we not replacing uh, the safety of the state, which is currently the dominant factor in the geopolitical framework, but rather adding that of human, human safety. That could help us change structurally the situation so that later on, because I don't see that happening in the short term, to towards these post-growth models, because I remind you, and I will finish, that is, has there ever been a moment in the history of humankind where humankind has been capable of, um, of avoiding the collapse of the system, knowing that what is about to come is something that is a complete disaster? And have we ever changed the economic model or the safety model model to avoid that collapse, or rather, has it been the opposite? Until the the collapse has not arrived, has not something new arisen, and something new that doesn't necessarily have to be good. Now we, we saw a Second World War where some rules of the game were eliminated and other rules were imposed, and these rules of the game have now reached their limits that we can see now, and we're saying now that we have to be ahead of the collapse of the system to try and imagine something different. Will we be capable this time? That is a great question from my point of view. And all of us and the civil society have to work and it is something that is very much necessary. Thank you so much, Jesus. Before I give before I um I ask the questions from the Q&A session, I wanted to ask a question to all three of you, to Richard, to Gaia, and to Jesus. And it's a question following uh, this this topic. Do you think that gender should be, um, including gender perspectives, should be one first step towards uh, an economy for well-being? You can answer in whichever order you want. It's actually a very good segue to also answer uh, Jesus's question because yes, we've we've seen that in human history where people did uh, change their uh, entire system and ways of organizing together in time to avoid collapse. We have also seen uh, cases where people did not do that. So it's certainly true, we, but we do have examples mm -hmm. of both things. Uh, this idea uh, that humans are absolutely incapable of changing or any acting on any foresight is not true. And if you go into the history, then you can actually see the difference in the organizational modes that human beings had uh, in in avoiding collapse or not avoiding it. And it's very interesting. So historians and, and our systems thinkers, they analyze these different kinds of societies. And what they saw was that when there was uh, low inequalities, including gender inequality, seemed to be a very high indicator. When there was, uh, where there was a high equality between people in general, so um, you know, uh, also for example, for uh, mentally uh, neuro neurodivergent people and uh, uh, homosexual people, that sort of thing, where there was high tolerance and high gender equality, these were almost always societies that were much better in acting on foresight. You see, that was called the is, is called the partnership model, and we have two of these models throughout human history. Partnership model is one, and the other is called a domination model, and that also organizes. It's a way of organizing in societies uh, that's much more rule based, very strong hierarchies. Uh, 
differences between people very much interpreted in terms of quality, so superior or inferior. Man is above woman. Uh, uh, you know, certain races, certain religions are above others. And you see that those were almost always completely unsustainable. So they just didn't take care of their environment enough. And then you saw that those those are the kind of empires that we that we hear of that imploded. They also, also always have this high, uh, enormous, elaborate hierarchies and a lot of violence as well to maintain these. So, uh, you know, what we have to do basically is go shift more towards a partnership model. And so in short, yes, the answer to your question is yes, that we would also have to uh, really focus on gender equality to get that done. Should I continue? Uh, continue, Richard. Okay. Yes, please, yeah. Richard, go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, I agree with uh, uh, Gaia. Uh, th there's also a lot of uh, research in uh, Global South are uh, showing that uh, the participation of women and other uh, disadvantaged groups in decision making is uh, conducive to development and conducive to uh, to peace. Um, so yes, gender inclusion is an important part of both uh, the well-being economy and uh, uh, um, political uh, stability. Um, and even of if even of geopolitical uh, stability, if you look at two of the persons who are most uh, threatening to the EU and to uh, uh, the world in general, uh, Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, they they both display or they're typical examples of uh, toxic uh, masculinity, as it is called. Uh, a desire to to dominate others, to humiliate them, uh, even um, a promise to restore traditional uh, hierarchies in society: uh, men over women, uh, heterosexuals over homosexuals, uh, men over nature, um, as well. Um, so, uh, as long as there is not enough. Uh, of a counterforce to this kind of uh, of thinking, uh, to this uh, image of what it means to be a real man, uh, we're in trouble. Um, so yeah, I definitely uh, agree with uh, um, gender inclusion, gender equality as as an important part of both a well-being economy and a more stable world. world. Thank you very much, Richard. And I now give you the floor before we start with the questions that the audience has asked. Yes, I'm going to be very short. I completely agree with what has been said, amongst other things, because we do not have the luxury of leaving half of humankind aside to face the problems that we're currently facing of such a magnitude. We don't need to think about the Afghanistan of the Taliban that, to understand that the complete um, rejection and um, and despising half of the population will allow for a well-being in that country or to to have a safe um, a safe country and on the other hand because we have we have all of the evidence especially for people such as me who work in the in the prevention of violent conflicts we see that where women have a space in the informal world as well as in the formal world for the negotiation of, of violent conflicts there is a great there are greater odds for success so if we want a more fair just world a safer world and more sustainable world then it's obvious that the participation of women is is paramount so that we can once and for all achieve that equality be, between all of us thank you so much jesus well there are questions for 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 Richard, for Jesus, and for Gaia. So I'm going to start with you, Gaia. The first question comes from Mark Hoffman, and he says, your uh, presentation seems to... Um, 
to be tending towards the donut theory. So Kate Raworth is saying that the degrowth is one of the many ways of doing it and mentions green growth as another way of doing it. So working at Schneider's biggest competitor, I find myself at a professional environment that seeks to implement green growth more than degrowth. What would you say is the biggest argument to be made for the one over the other? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the biggest argument is probably that there's no evidence of green growth actually working. Uh, I, I would like that too. I think many of us, I think its height was the mention. If you go to Ingram, Google Ingram, it, it shows the word count for in all kinds of publications. And you can see that green growth really reached its peak around 2008. I believed in that still too. I love that. We, who doesn't like a win-win? Of course. But, uh, you know, by now we, we you can really see that it, it's just not happening like at all. Uh, it, there's just no, the idea behind green growth is of course decoupling. There is zero decoupling in terms of anything on sustainability except greenhouse gases. That's just one thing. Eh? We're, all the water, the mass biodiversity loss, all those things are, there's zero decoupling. There is some decoupling in greenhouse gases in just a handful of countries, but even that is not enough for their share of the Earth's carrying capacity. Uh, so it's, it's not anywhere near this necessary, sufficient, absolute decoupling that we need, even in those few countries that show some decoupling, let alone on a, on a global scale. Our greenhouse gases are still going up. So it's, uh, it's just not there. Uh, that would be the biggest argument. I think, um, I don't want to talk, I don't want to speak for Kate Rayworth, but um, from what I understand from her is that she has also by now let that go a bit and is more in the degrowth where she sees that as uh, really the only way to do it. And and I'm the same way. I used to think that uh, green growth could work, You, but anybody who looks at the data has to admit that it's just not there, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, if I may... Um, to be to be clear, uh, the the well-being econ economy replaces its ultimate goal with something else. So uh, in that sense, it's definitely different than what we currently have. We have some well-being, but only basically only when it's profitable. And if you look at all kinds of indicators of our well-being, uh, those haven't increased for a while. And in a many ways, they have been decreasing since the 70s, especially in the US where you could they have really taken this whole capitalism like turbocharge. Um, and, and you can see that uh, life satisfaction, all kinds of health indicators have been on a decline for a while in the US. So uh, uh, in a well-being economy, those would be paramount. So they, those would probably increase because that's your ultimate goal. So it's it very much is a very different thing than just having well-being as a byproduct of growth as we currently have. Thank you so much, Gaia. And there is a question for Richard now. It's Juanjo's question. And he asks us, how come we can destine resources to defense considering how scarce those resources are? And if we are about to degrow, and especially considering that there are such great um, social differences and this has been created on the basis of generosity. So how can we do this? Good question. Um, it's true that uh, defense uh, eats uh, resources um, uh, as well. Um, in our report, we uh, underline the need, the need to uh, start decarbonizing defense and making it more circular uh, as far as is possible. Uh, uh, but um, that doesn't uh, uh, change effect that uh, strengthening our defense and, and also supporting Ukraine, that it that it um, it will take some of the uh, critical uh, materials uh, that we uh, are already in in, in short supply um, uh, of. Um, so yeah, we, we we really have to take a look at uh, degrowth proposals that allow us to reduce our consumption of these. Uh, um, critical materials uh, in other domains uh, as soon as possible. 
and and one domain where we can really save a huge amount of uh, critical materials, uh, rare earth, uh, cobalt, nickel, lithium, uh, is the domain of uh, mobility. Uh, we should not try to replace every fossil fuel car with an electric car. That's completely uh, unsustainable. We should really uh, boost uh, cycling, walking, uh, public transport, and shared uh, electric cars. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we'll be in trouble uh, ecologically, uh, but also uh, geopolitically, given our uh, dependence mm -hmm. on uh, the import of these critical materials. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you very much. We will now read a question for Jesus. Blanca Vázquez asks, does the UN have a role or the global institutions have a role or can we just be in the hands of the will of nations? Well, we should trust in the UN since they are the legitimate uh, representatives of the international community, but obviously the UN is only the messenger of national governments and in the uh, definition of the rules of the game, there are obviously different weights given to different countries. Some are more powerful than other. So especially with everything that has to do with peace and security, it has to do with the composition and the decision-making process of the Security Council. It's what I was saying previously in an implicit way. Those rules, that composition, that decision-making process derives from the collapse of the previous system by the Society of Nations that shows that those who feel the winners to be the winners in the Second World War are imposing a, some rules of the game that represent their interests. And that is what we still have nowadays. So although the UN is making very interesting proposals very often and, and interesting declarations, their uh, capacity to maneuver is still limited by the weight of some government, especially the five big ones that have the right to veto and who are always present in the council. We are seeing that in the case of the Ukraine and in the case of Israel in Gaza. With that, uh, those different rules and different ways of measuring the situation, that is quite visible. As long as that doesn't change, we will have to conclude that just a few states have the capacity to make decisions and they are the ones who drag everyone behind them. There is a great difference when we think about an international order, a different international order. I think about Kofi Annan's report when he was the general secretary in 2005. There was a larger concept of freedom, of development, of safety and human rights for all. Kofi Annan was telling us that we cannot have development without security, we cannot have security without development, and we cannot have development or security without fully respecting human rights. Those are the three basic pillars of any international order that is better than the one that we have had up till now. Have we put it in practice? No, since 2005 we have not made any progress. We have actually gone backwards in some cases due to what I was saying previously. We are in a scenario of competition between global powers. The US wanting to maintain their hegemony and China challenging that hegemony, while others suffer the consequences of that challenge. And others, as the EU, are trying still um, unsuccessfully up till now to find a crevice to find their own role. But we are still in that same scenario, and we have seen for a very long time that it's not capable of solving the current problems in the world, and it is actually the one generating many of the problems that we currently have. Thank you so much. I have written some questions, some other questions. Let's see. So for Gaia, one of the questions is, is from Stefano Turini. He says, is it better to use the degrowth um, trend or that of well-being? Do you know of any good practice of governments who have used the well-being economy at the urban level? Yes, so thank you for that question, because that's that's a very useful question. I answered really a, a little bit in the chat, but that's so the difference between deep growth and a well-being economy is that a well-being economy is where we want to go. Currently, we have a growth based economy. We want to go to a well-being economy. What I just 
uh, described, so the policies changing the narrative, that's basically what degrowth is. So degrowth is a pathway towards well-being economy. And what that means is that we purposefully bring down our ecological footprint. We do not wait for the market to do it. That's not how markets work. We have to purposely decide we're going to bring that down. And we do it in a way that's socially just. So that's the key difference between a recession and degrowth. You still, uh, you, you bring down your ecological footprint. Uh, maybe the GDP will go down to uh, as well. It doesn't have to, because in, uh, again, if we bring down our carbon emissions through renewable energy, that renewable energy sector is going to grow. So but we, again, we don't really care about that anymore. We just actively bring down our ecological footprint uh, and we do it in a way that we protect the most vulnerable in society. That's a key difference between degrowth and a recession. Um, and so, the, and then the ultimate goal is to get to a well being economy, which will still be. Uh, very dynamic. A lot of people think that you need growth for progress. That's that's not how it works. Uh, but uh, you know, it's going to be an equilibrium, a dynamic equilibrium. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Gaia. And I will now uh, read a question for Richard. It says the EU is currently debating, uh, debating. I'm sorry, this question is from Sergio Corbalan. It says the EU is currently debating once again its strategic autonomy policy, politics uh, or interdependence so that they can have more resistant supply chains and a new a way of thinking of competitivity. Uh, what new arguments can we use to convince uh, politicians to understand that thinking beyond growth contributes really to a greater resilience and to a, a better understanding of the competitiveness of the EU? Thank you. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, no longer pursuing uh, economic growth, uh, prepare, preparing for post-growth, uh, reducing our overproduction and overconsumption, especially by the rich, uh, would make it easier for us in the EU to uh, reduce our dependence on imported uh, energy and, uh, and materials, including scarce critical raw materials such as the metals that I already uh, mentioned, that would boost our strategic uh, autonomy. It would make us less vulnerable to economic pressure, uh, especially from China, because China is dominating the supply chains of many of these uh, critical uh, materials. Um, so there are synergies between uh, um, post growth or degrowth and uh, strategic uh, autonomy. There are tensions as well to be expected with resource rich uh, um, developing uh, countries. I, I already mentioned Brazil and uh, uh, Chile. Um, and we should really, uh, if, if, you, if you want to build partnerships with them, we should really take seriously their desire to uh, develop their industries, to, do, to be more than just exporters of raw materials, uh, help them add value uh, to their uh, metal ores, for instance. And um, that also means something for uh, European policies and, and European uh, ambitions. Uh, the EU has taken, uh, has started a, a WTO case against Indonesia when uh, Indonesia decided that it uh, wanted to process its nickel ores before uh, exporting it. That's stupid because it's, it's really understandable that, that Indonesia wants to do more with uh, its nickel ores than, than, than just export it, uh, add value to it, uh, build battery factories. And it got these battery factories, only they're built by Chinese companies um, instead of European companies. So it, from, a, from a, a view of um, geopolitics, uh, it was a very stupid thing to start this WTO case against uh, Indonesia. And if we say that uh, 
the global south should be able to add more value uh to its uh raw materials uh have better jobs it, it also means that we can't have a goal of producing 90 percent of our uh electric car batteries uh, uh in europe um that, that's not fair as long as we import most of the uh the metals for these uh batteries so it would be more just uh to look at how we can diversify our supply of uh electric car batteries be be less dependent on china uh partner up with uh more democratic developing countries like brazil like chile like indonesia uh, so um yeah from a perspective of post growth and global justice and strengthening partnerships with the global south um i think uh um we can have more strategic autonomy but not necessarily uh in the way it is defined right now Thank you so much, Richard. And now a question for Jesus. For Jesus. This is a question asked by Julia, and she starts by making two observations. Uh, she says, none of you have talked about post-growth would fit in an economic system that only um, lives from capitalism. Can we have post-growth with capitalism? Considering that um, degrowth uh, system will not take place tomorrow, a state government should wait for the world change or can they change the discourse and start working in a post-capitalistic way? I think, Lourdes, that in this case, that question was not for me because I'm not an expert in post-growth or in degrowth. So I think that maybe Gaia or Richard could uh, provide a better a, a better I can't answer, answer, actually, I want to give maybe a different question. Yeah, I, I can answer, but no, I, no, I, habrá I, una más. Oh, yeah, okay, all right. Um, so can we have degrowth in capitalism? You know, that's a very, uh, I, I've asked myself that for a long time, and uh, I used to think that it probably it might be possible because capitalism hasn't been that narrowly defined it's a bit you could you could do a lot with it and the in implementation has differed uh, a lot in history uh, you know the the nordic countries for example northern european countries are also capitalist societies but they do have different outcomes in well-being than for example the us so uh, it it depends a little bit on how you do it uh, that said, I recently, uh, I fairly recently have come to realize that it will not be possible within capitalism because the ultimate thing in capitalism is that you have some people who don't work and then the rest who do the labor. The, the idea of private ownership, that's the definition typically, right? The private means of production. And um, you know, there's there's this, this sort of illusion that if you just very equally distribute all these production factors, what's wrong with private property? Um, but that's not how it works. The idea of capitalism is that there is a few people who own everything and the rest do not own that stuff and have only their labor to sell. So when I talk about, well, we have to sever that link between our livelihoods and the dependency on growth, obviously that is through jobs. And that would go directly against uh, real capitalists' best interests because they wouldn't be able to just use take more than they give back basically that that is what capitalism comes down to it's about enclosure of our commons like our uh, our our common natural capital as it's called it's not really capital but you know uh, our water our air is being privatized and then sold back to us our our needs are being commodified enable to make uh, in order to make profit all of that will always keep happening within capitalism so um there is some current debate going on between post growthers whether or not this can happen within capitalism so i should say that it's a very current debate i have recently come to conclude uh, just based on my research that it, it will not happen within capitalism itself 
Bien, pues vamos a final. Okay, then we will finish with just one thing, uh, which maybe Jesús, you can answer as an expert in the Arab world. Maybe you can give us an example, um, an, ex um, um, an answer. It's Carmen Molina asking about the unbalance that inequalities is currently causing in the distribution of wealth. How to interpret the um, association of the BRICS and the assumption of the fact that global north over south colonialism can be over? Well, one of the little things that we clearly know in the world of analyzing violent conflicts is that there is no there is no element that is as dangerous as inequalities, and that is both regionally, as in states, um, or even globally. So the main priority nowadays, if we want to have a fairer world, would be to eliminate those inequalities, or at least to reduce them. Up, down to bearable nevel, levels or manageable levels. But that is not in the agenda because the reports tell us that inequalities are just going up and up. And the globalization model we're in is, is leaving everyone behind against the principles that we have so many, so, so many times said that we defended, which was not leaving anyone behind. That's the sad truth. I think that the BRICS right now, even with the with the um, the increase that has just been approved are not thinking of, a, of an alternative model. They only want to get rid of the dominion of others, but they're not providing us with a replacement. They just compete in this globalized world so that they can increase. And we're still talking about the growth model. They just grow. They just want to grow so that they can have more specific weight. So it can be good for other things, but I don't think that it is good for what it is that we're talking about here, which is the post-growth in the post-growth arena. So by definition and according to what we've known of till now, I do not think that it is a real alternative. I don't think it is, it's advisable. I don't think it's an alternative that allows us to see a difference in the horizon. Well, thank you so much, Jesus. And to finish this round of questions, Richard, what are the next steps that we will be taking with this project? Thank you. Maybe one small remark about uh, capitalism uh, and post-capitalism. Um, I, I would hate people leaving this webinar thinking, well, it, it's, it's, it's gotten worse. We have to get rid of capitalism uh, as well, uh, next to uh, economic growth, uh, etc. Um, it really, for me, it's very helpful to see... Um, capitalism and post-capitalism as a, a continuum, uh, a sliding scale. Uh, there are different steps that you can take which bring you closer to post-capitalism uh, and which would make it easier to 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 make the uh, change towards uh, post-growth and a well-being economy uh, uh, as well. And uh, one important thing in that respect is... Uh, change the way uh, uh, our companies are uh, are managed to 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 make sure that it's not just shareholders but other stakeholders uh, who have a say uh, as well to put uh, nature uh, uh, at the table uh, of the board of directors as well as some companies have already uh, done so if, if you see it as a, a gradual shift from capitalism to post capitalism, it becomes more uh, manageable, uh, I think. Uh, next steps, uh, our report is being translated right now in, in, in different languages, at least uh, six, uh, I think, and we will be organizing more uh, uh, webinars and uh, seminars, uh, not that many between now and the uh, European elections, but uh, because of uh, uh, European uh, rules. But uh, we will definitely uh, do a lot more uh, activities around this theme uh, in the second half of this year. Uh, so, so uh, really, I would uh, implore you to subscribe to the newsletter of the Green European Foundation. Then you're sure you will not miss any of these events. Well, thank you so much, and we will conclude. I mean, so many things have been said, and all of them very important. 
and some of them contradictory, but that's the good thing about debates, isn't it? I, I'm going to try and summarize some ideas. We have talked about the need to reduce um, overconsumption and overproduction and the need to um, democratically manage the limits of growth. We have talked and I think that there has been unanimity unanimity in that way about the need in any post-growth economy to have gender equality and we have talked about the fact that people and the planet have to be above profit and that it is needed to to reach human and nature's well-being and we have we have talked, I think all three of us have talked, and uh, at least Richard and Jesus have talked about the growth uh, or the rise of, of the far right that demands for the EU to be more intolerant um, with regards to intolerance. And we have to stop we have to stop it so that it won't prevent us from having a post-growth Europe that really takes into account the limits of growth. And we have talked about the importance of social movements and the mobilization of civil society. Jesus was saying that many of the things that have been achieved, such as with regards to um, mines, um, uh, was thanks to the mobilization um, of civil society. It's not the only element, but it is an important element. So again, for instance, the movement against landmines, anti-personal landmines. And Jesus was also saying that humankind security is about satisfying basic needs and fundamental of, uh, rights. And Gaia was saying that with capitalism, we cannot have post-growth, although in that sense, I think that Richard was not really in agreement in his last intervention. It didn't seem that he was completely in agreement. And what I do think is that there is an agreement with regards to reducing inequalities that are increasing year over year. And what is clear is that the debate and is very necessary. We should have many more debates such as this one because it's, it's clear that that many ideas are floating around there are many expectations many needs and we we obviously require debates such as these so that we can counteract and so that we can draw conclusions so once again thank you to the green european foundation thank you richard thank you gaia and thank you jesus so much and i would like to thank our interpreter as well and to all the people who have participated thank you very much